Meet Louis Boudreau. As a child, he loved athletics and he played baseball for Thornton Township High School in Illinois. As so many young baseball players do, he dreamed of playing for the major leagues. After attending the University of Illinois, he was chosen to play for the Cleveland Indians. His career as a first baseman in Major League Baseball earned him the American League Most Valuable Player Award and more importantly, a place in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Meet Ruth Kolker. She too adored athletics, especially baseball. But as she grew up, she was told that baseball was for boys and that the only sports she was suited for were tumbling and scooter racing. She said that the result of this sexism was that she lacked confidence in game situations and recognized the uselessness of athletic skills for her as a girl. By the time she was ready to learn to pitch, her love of sports had been destroyed by constant reminders that she wasn't good enough to play. Reevaluating Title IX, the debate over the Tower and Javits Amendments. Before 1972, this was just the way it was. Men made it big in sports, and women were told there was no team for them, and left with tarnished high school trophies and a household to care for. But in the late 1960s and early 1970s, talk about the Equal Rights Amendment was revolutionizing popular opinion concerning women's role in athletics. Just the moment of the 70s, it was an explosive moment, particularly for the women's movements. You know, the 70s were kind of, you know, uh, a time of, of people demanding equal rights. And I think the timing was right because I think people were more interested in being active. One such activist was Patsy T. Mink. She spent hours working out the specifics of this law, finally bringing it to Congress in early 1972. But on the day it was to be voted on, Patsy's daughter had a health emergency and she was unable to attend the vote. The absence of her vote caused Title IX to be rejected by exactly one but Patsy didn't give up. She convinced Carl Albert, the Speaker of the House, to reintroduce the bill. This time her vote was counted, and on June 23, 1972, President Nixon signed the bill that changed everything for young women who loved sports. Title IX states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Pertaining to sports, the law meant that, in a federally funded school, if a men's team exists, a woman's team must as well. If this is not possible, women must be allowed to play with the men. Modifications to sports programs weren't always made. Women protesters were disregarded by men in power who felt it was easier to ignore the law. One such group, the crew team at Yale, stalked into the athletic director's office, naked, with the words Title IX written on their backs. Title IX was not perfect, and male coaches and athletes took advantage of its flaws, finding loopholes and exceptions wherever possible. First thing that happened was there was great excitement, I think, uh, but there was also uh, guarded excitement. You know, the, the law was there, and that was great, but there was no teeth in it. In 1975, an amendment was proposed by John G. Tower that would have made dodging this law even easier. Though his amendment never made it through the House and Senate, the debate that it generated allowed for the passage of the Javits Amendment, which, in turn, created more opportunities for women in sports. Born in Houston in 1925, Tower was always proud of his state, and he worked his hardest to serve it. As disdain for Title IX spread through the South, Tower began to construct a revision to the law that would appease even the most adamant critics of Title IX. In July of 1974, he introduced the Tower Amendment, which aimed to exempt revenue-producing sports from Title IX. Tower believed that it was these sports in which the differences between men and women's abilities were the most distinct. Also, he reasoned that the men's teams paid for themselves and, even more importantly, supported the school's other athletic endeavors. What that also does is it says that some athletes are more valuable than others. Some athletes are more valuable because of the sport they play. The amendment passed through the Senate unanimously, but before it was brought to the House, Patsy T. Mink, once again, got involved. Infuriated with Tower's attempt to undermine her law, Patsy sent secret letters to representatives in the House that discussed her plans to outmaneuver Tower with a new amendment, one that supported her position instead. 
This new amendment was proposed by Jacob K. Javits. After being elected to the House and serving as New York's Attorney General, Javits was elected as New York Senator and introduced the Javits Amendment to Title IX. He proposed that Title IX be enforced with respect to intercollegiate athletic activities, ensuring that Title IX applied to all college sports, whether they are revenue producing or not. This amendment infuriated the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or the NCAA, because its language specifically mentioned college sports, countering the argument that athletics should not be included in Title IX. Despite the NCAA's opposition, however, the measure passed. Women's groups viewed the ratification of the Javits Amendment as a triumph because it inexorably linked collegiate sports to Title IX, and through Title IX, with gender equality itself. Even though Title IX increased equality for women in sports, it was the debate over these two amendments that truly brought attention to the issue of inequality. The idea of leaving out revenue-producing sports from the scope of Title IX spurred discussion of what Title IX really meant, and eventually it determined just the opposite of Tower's intention, creating an amendment that solidified women's opportunities in all collegiate sports. Title IX is a huge legacy for women's sports. I didn't even have to think twice about playing sports. All the opportunities in the world were there for me, and that is linked to Title IX. Women were given not only equally paid, but equally talented coaches. They were given access to funds usually devoted solely to sports that made millions. These debates became stepping stones on women's path to equality. Because the Tower Amendment was rejected and the Javits Amendment was ratified in its place, women have continued to thrive in sports all over America, and the number of women in varsity athletics has jumped from less than 295,000 in 1971 to 2.8 million in 2001, an increase of 847%. Young girls today have opportunities of which their grandmothers could never have dreamed. They are no longer thought of to be delicate or weak. As girls' opportunities increase, so does their self-confidence and their sense of worth. They grow older knowing that their gender has nothing to do with the accomplishments they can achieve or the length they can run. The world is just as wide open for them as it is to their male peers whether they want to become a star soccer player or a seamstress. And they know if they're going to go to college and play softball, you know, they're not going to be out on some crummy field with no equipment while the boys are in some beautiful stadium. It's over! Ten seconds left, but listen to this crowd!